I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Tesla cuts prices again. The electric vehicle maker reducing the cost of more expensive models for the second time this year. We'll bring you the details. Plus, time to buy Apple. After sitting on the sidelines for the last six years, Goldman Sachs says it is time to jump in on the iPhone maker, despite missing out on a 300% advance, we'll discuss. And the push to ban TikTok. Senator Mark Warner plans to introduce a bill this week to allow the US to systematically ban Chinese technology. That's including services like the social media giant. All that and so much more coming up. But first, let's get a check on markets. Interesting session. We're kind of modestly higher on the NASDAQ 100, up about a tenth of a percent. Similarly, on the S&P 500, the main gauge of US equities, we kind of appeared earlier gains. And we're waiting on double dose of Chair Powell, right? Fed Chair Powell speaking twice this week. We had a great week for equities last week. We're kind of treading water as yields pushed higher up six basis points on the 10-year to 3.95%. And Bitcoin continuing to trade in this kind of narrow range just above 22,000 US dollars per token. Really interesting some of the specific movers, though, when you think about equity names in particular. You mentioned Apple and that Goldman call, really pushing it to the upside, up 1.9%. Alphabet parent company of Google, considerably higher. Six straight day of gains, best run since January of 2021. Some of the movers to the downside, Amazon still under pressure, down 1.2%. And Tesla, down two percentage points after cutting prices here in the US on Model S and Model X, including the plaid varietals over the weekend. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Dana Hole, who is reporting where are the price cuts and what do we know about them in the last 24 hours? So Tesla cut the prices last night. They changed the website. And the Model S is now roughly $5,000 cheaper across both models. And the X is almost $10,000 cheaper. Interestingly, now the Plaid is the exact same for both the S and the X. And I think what's significant is that we've seen Tesla tweak prices quite a bit. This is kind of a significant change to come in March. We have you know, roughly three and a half, four weeks left in the quarter. Tesla definitely changes prices, but uh, is this a demand question or is this just Tesla trying to cut costs for consumers? Well, let's jump in on that. We, we every day go to our audience and ask, what do you make of this story? And the question is, do these price cuts push you to buy what is a still very expensive vehicle. The results kind of mix, actually. I would say, you know, almost 50% of respondents say, no, these are too expensive. What has Tesla said so far in 2023 about demand? Because they tend to use price cuts as a lever, frankly, oh, totally. to find pockets of demand. Absolutely. Well, Musk said last week at Investor Day that demand for Tesla's cars is infinite and that the biggest, you know, the limiting factor is, is price. So, you know, but 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 again, I mean, the, the vast majority of Tesla sales right now are the three and the Y. And, they, you know, he's even said that the S and the X are kind of like antique models that eventually will go the way, you know, I mean, they're sort of like legacy models that they make because people are fond of them. But they are still quite expensive cars. The fact that they are cutting at this point in the quarter to me means that they are trying to stoke demand. They must have inventory that they're trying to move. Uh, you have a really terrific piece out. Uh, newsletter or, or Bloomberg Terminal piece? Both both newsletter and terminal piece, value for money, uh, mm -hmm. on this, this great deep bench of talent at Tesla. And I thought this was so important and worth taking a look at. Last week at Investor Day, Elon Musk is up on stage, a site we're familiar with. But behind him there, you see it on the screen, 16 or so executives. 16, yeah. We, I, I don't think we have time to go through all 16, but there are sort of a top three that you've picked out. Who are these new names? behind Elon Musk. Yeah, so this is the first time that so many people have been on stage with Elon. And I think it's a clear sign that the company is trying to be like, hey, even though Elon Musk bought Twitter, we have this deep bench of talent. Tom Zhu is clearly a rising star, as you reported earlier right. this year. You know, Tom has kind of a growing remit within Tesla, overseeing manufacturing, not just in China, but in Texas and potentially in Mexico as well. Um, I thought the presentation by Rebecca Tanucci, who oversees charging, was spectacular. She's like an executive that we've never heard of. Um, and then uh, Brendan uh, Earhart, who's the recently hired general counsel, came to Tesla from DISH. He briefly appeared on stage, and he's the first sort of big outside hire that we've had at Tesla in quite a while. Just showing those kind of less familiar names on the screen just then. You're right, we've reported Tom Zhu now has kind of moved away from China where he was really focused to globally looking at manufacturing. Uh, Earhart, interesting. You and I have reported a lot on the turnover of legal names mm -hmm. at Tesla. You've covered Tesla for so long and you've done so many of these events. Why was this one different? What was the kind of standout feature of it? 
Well, this was, I mean, it was a four-hour event, so it was quite <laughs> quite the long saga. It reminded me a little bit of, of Battery Day 2.0, in which they right. were giving a lot of very detailed, highly technical information about their thinking, but there wasn't a clear product announcement. I think a lot of retail investors and Wall Street, frankly, were were disappointed. They wanted to see a concept of the car. They didn't want to see like a future car under a white sheet, which is what the slide showed. But we did get to hear from a lot of people. And I mean, you know, t part of Tesla's talent is people. And it's rare that they showcase people. Part of our talents are people too here at Bloomberg. Bloomberg's done a whole terrific reporting on all things Tesla. Now let's stay in the world of EVs and actually autonomous vehicles. Amazon's Zooks division is facing a federal inquiry into the self-certification of its passenger vehicle as meeting safety standards. NHTSA says it's launching an inquiry for more information on the data and testing the company used to certify its vehicle that was equipped with automated driver assistance software. The government didn't cite any problems or violations in the announcement. Zooks' general counsel told me in a statement, this is a request quest to gain an additional level of detail and information on the self-certification tests Zooks performed, which have met or exceeded government requirements. We are committed to working closely with NHTSA on the questions they have, and we remain confident in our self-certification process and data. Now, another story we're watching, Goldman Sachs says it's time to buy Apple shares. Goldman is taking a bite out of the Apple, well, Apple shares. The firm is recommending the stock as a buy for the first time in nearly six years. See what I did there? Analyst Michael Ern has taken over coverage of the stock, and he says Apple's large user base is going to help the iPhone maker grow its services business. And because of its lead in design, fostering brand loyalty, Goldman think that Apple is able to reduce the number of users leaving the Apple ecosystem and to keep them making repeat purchases. So back to the last time Goldman had the equivalent of a buy on Apple, 2017. The stock has rallied more than 300% since then. Goldman's price target of $199 implies more than 30% upside from the last close. That's way above the average target of $169.61. So Goldman's done sitting on the sidelines with Apple. Anyone else? An interesting piece we put out there on social media because the stock also got a bit of a bump just in the session alone from that Goldman call, as we said in the piece, up more than 300% since the last time Goldman had the equivalent of a buy. So let's stick with Apple because Apple's gearing up to launch its next slate of laptops, desktops, and including that new iMac. Bloomberg Mark German here with those details. You're writing in your newsletter this morning about what's to come. What do we expect? Yeah, so new Macs. New Macs are coming soon. There's going to be a new 15-inch MacBook Air. This is going to be the, fit, the first time that Apple has made a larger size MacBook Air. That's going to be appealing to people who want a bigger screen size, but in a quite a bit cheaper, more portable package. There's people like me who have the biggest MacBook Pro you can get, not because you want the performance, but because you want the screen real estate. So now you'll be able to get that in a lighter and cheaper package. Also, a new 13-inch right. MacBook Air coming in the next few months. Later this year, the first update to the iMac, right, in about two, two and a half years, that will have an M3 chip, their next generation processor. And speaking of new Apple products, there's also something coming sooner than these new Macs. Imminent, I'm told, is a new iPhone 14 color. Uh, so look out for that this week. It's interesting because you and I started the year kind of really focused on the upcoming AR VR headset. But you forget that the, the cadence of new products and releases is, is quite closely tracked. And you wrote in the newsletter, the most frequent question I get ahead of my weekly column is something along the lines of, when is a new iMac coming out? Why is everyone waiting specifically on a new iMac? Yeah, the iMac is really what started Apple over again under Steve Jobs in the late 1990s, right? And this all-in-one machine that now has become essentially an iPad with a 24-inch screen on a stand, it's not their most popular Mac. Those go to the 13-inch MacBook Pro, a base model, as well as the MacBook Air. But it's very well received in schools, like in computer right. labs and such. People like to put them in their living rooms, in kids' rooms, people who work from home. It's been a really hot buy for work from home, uh, remote work setups, hybrid work environments. And that machine, like I said, has not been updated since April 2021, right? So Apple fans, you know, they all want to know when that new model is coming out because they don't want to buy uh, an M1 iMac, which from a processor standpoint has been outdated already for, you know, six to nine months, if not longer. They want to know when the new one's coming out. 
And I'm told well, it's reached an advanced stage uh, called EVT. They're now doing test production of the iMac. They're gearing up for mass production in about three months from now. It's gonna look similar, have basically all the same features as the current model, but that faster M3 chip, which is really gonna dial up the performance, uh, which is what you want for a machine with a 24 inch screen for people doing video editing and such. Well, that's where I was gonna go. Let's talk silicon just really quickly. Which chips do the new gen of MacBooks have, the ones that are due out imminently? Right, so the, the next chip for Apple is going to be that M3 chip. I don't believe that's going to arrive uh, until later in the year with either that iMac or that update to the 13-inch MacBook Air. Uh, the, this 15-inch MacBook Air is going to come a bit sooner uh, than the M3 chip's availability, so that's likely to have a variation of the M2 or the M2 Pro chip that's already available in sort of those base MacBook Pros uh, and the 13-inch MacBook Air today. But the M3 chip, whenever that does hit, that's going to be a pretty considerable upgrade for anyone coming from an M1. That's the first time Apple's going to move from a 5 nanometer production uh, technology to a 3 nanometer production uh, technology. That's going to allow Apple to dial up the speed a bit on the CPU side, but also yes. because of that new production process through TSMC, the efficiency and battery life is likely to improve as well. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Thank you so much. Remember to subscribe to Mark's weekly column. Now, coming up, a new China tech competition bill is working its way through the Senate with TikTok is enemy number one. And before we go to break, I just want to check on shares of Snap during Monday's session. You see there, we're up almost 10%, biggest jump since the first week of February. Really some, some read-through of the crackdown on TikTok and some feel-good for Snap shares are getting a boost from that news. We'll track that story coming up. This is Bloomberg. You had 100 million Americans on TikTok 90 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Even you guys would like that kind of return 90 <laughs> minutes a day. They are taking data from Americans, not keeping it safe. But what worries me more with TikTok is that this can be a propaganda tool to basically the kind of videos you see uh, would promote ideological uh, issues. If you look at what TikTok shows to the Chinese kids, which is all about science and engineering, versus what our kids see, mm -hmm. there's a radical difference. That was Senator Mark Warner, who plans to introduce a bill this week to allow the U.S. to systematically ban Chinese technology, including services like TikTok, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons out in D.C. with more. Kaylee, what do we know about this particular bill? Well, we know it has bipartisan support because the co-sponsor of Democratic Senator Mark Warner's bill is Republican John Thune from South Dakota. So this, in theory, is supported on both sides of the aisle here, at least by some members. And it gives the U.S. the authority on national concern security concern grounds to ban or prohibit certain Chinese technology here in the U.S. And when he was asked on that Sunday program he was speaking on about that, he said, yes, that does include ByteDance's TikTok. As you uh, saw in the clip there, he has two concerns here, one about the potential propaganda element, the other about data security, because as we're all right. scrolling on TikTok, our data is being collected. And the concern is that ByteDance, being a Chinese company, then would have that data being shared with the Chinese government. Now, it's important to note ByteDance has said it operates independently, that its data is secured through an alliance with Oracle when it comes uh, to U.S. customers. But there's been a significant amount of pushback against that, including from FBI Director uh, Chris Wray, who has said that China controls the algorithm and China can access the data. And so this is the concern here with yet another potential uh, legislation being introduced to prohibit or restrict TikTok in some form. There does appear to be momentum behind this initiative. On this program, we've been talking about some form of legislation around mm -hmm. not just TikTok, but Chinese technology generally for some time. Why is this bill different, I suppose? 
Well, Senator Warner has said he intends to design this bill so it can resist any kind of legal challenges because we have seen other proposals put forward that have run into some resistance, like uh, Republican Josh Hawley's, for example, the No TikTok on United States Devices Act would put a total ban on TikTok here in the U.S., prohibit uh, allowing the president to prohibit the use and download of it. There has been some criticism that that actually is a violation of First Amendment rights to free speech because you're restricting uh, the content people people could put out there. So there are some kind of legal questions here that make it difficult for a measure like this to get over the finish line. We'll have to see ultimately if it does. I will say, though, what we're talking about here is an expansion uh, of bans on TikTok from the public sector to the broader U.S. public, because you already have in place Congress banning TikTok from government devices last year in the White House last month, mandating that federal yes. agencies remove it from phones and systems. Kaylee, the other big headline out of D.C. from a kind of oversight perspective is what President Biden is considering doing in terms of executive orders and restrictions on China. What do we know? Well, we know from Bloomberg reporting that this is in the works, and we are expecting that funding for this program we're talking about will be included in the president's budget on March 9th, so we could get full details on Thursday. But it's essentially restricting U.S. investment in Chinese technology, specifically technology that advances intelligence and military capabilities of the Chinese government. So while we don't know what exactly technologies are being specified here, we should get more details in the coming days. We don't know it from the reporting at this point, but think things like semiconductor or artificial intelligence, chat GPT like products, as well as quantum computing. All of that is expected to be included in the scope here. And what is noteworthy and important to me is that when uh, in these conversations that Bloomberg had with those working on this policy for the administration, something that was raised was the idea that this isn't just about money. It is also about talent and expertise uh, that U.S. individuals can share with Chinese companies, and they want to put uh, restrictions around that. So as you say, this is about a broader competition element between the U.S. and China, and it's a story we're going to have to continue to follow and expect to get details from the president on in the coming days. Bloomberg's Katie Lines, Mountain D.C. Thank you. Now, from TikTok to Twitter, this morning the app suffered its second outage in a week. In response, Elon Musk called the platform brittle. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner is here, resident social media reporter, all things social. It was one of those mornings where it just happens. Yeah. Is Monday Twitter down? Morning. People ask. Yeah. I, I did, I wrote a haiku actually. <laughs> Because it's like, you know, when you go on Twitter and Twitter's down, everyone is on the platform asking, is Twitter down? That was my tweet. Sad, gloomy Monday, a busy Twitter breaking. Sigh, the outages. That was pretty good. But this is more than just a, a sort of regular outage, right? Yeah, I mean, you have a, first of all, you have a future here if, if the TV thing doesn't work out, <laughs> writing poetry. Ed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, we've, I've been on this show, we've talked about this. Everyone who's followed Twitter knows that over the last couple of weeks, uh, and months, the staff at Twitter has been slashed, right? I mean, we're yes. talking uh, well over 50% of employees that were just a few months ago are now gone. And so when, uh, you know, we see that happen and when those, uh, a lot of those people are engineers, they're site reliability folks, um, suddenly you, you know, see these outages happening with more frequency. This is something that a lot of people thought would happen when Elon first took over. It didn't right away. You may remember everyone was like, hey, look, Twitter seems to be working fine. Well, it's starting to catch up to the company. We, a um, bit. we did kind of get a, a response from Elon Musk that went some way to explaining what caused the outage. I think we can bring the tweet back up. But the point is, is that they're trying to make fixes with a skeleton staff. A small API change had massive ramifications, according to Elon Musk. This is happening regularly, though. I mean, what are they trying to do that's causing this? Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing, right? I mean, when you uh, go from having dozens, if not hundreds of engineers working on something to a very small group, uh, you know, even just one little change, one little bug, you have to detect it, you have to go and you have to fix it, you have to push that change, everyone. Like, it, it's, you know, maybe only down for an hour, but it's the kind of thing that might have gotten caught or, or fixed even quicker had there been uh, more bodies in the room, right? And so I think we're just seeing the kind of price of all these cost cuts um, starting to, to happen to the platform in, ter in terms of its reliability. Still a platform that people are using and, and they're talking this about on. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, thank you very much. Thanks. Now, coming up, we'll bring you the latest in tech news from China as President Xi Jinping is emphasizing the country's investment in the tech sector. That's all next. This is Bloomberg.
Time now for Talking Tech, and let's get over to China. Bao Fan, co-founder of China Renaissance, and one of the tech industry star bankers has vanished. His firm issued a statement that he is cooperating in an unspecified investigation. The banker's disappearance is sending shudders through China's corporate class in spite of some pushback and some encouraging words from state media. Meanwhile, President Xi Jinping is officially backing the tech sector. In his opening remarks at the National People's Congress, he said the country will take forceful measures to support the development of high-end manufacturing and emphasize the country's need to ensure its self-reliance in technology. And as part of that grand project, China also plans to create a central agency to manage the flow of data within the country and abroad. That according to the Wall Street Journal, citing sources. Beijing intends to set up a new national data bureau that will become the top overseer of data-related issues to strengthen its control over the valuable data generated by swaths of the economy, including the internet industry. Now, coming up, a satellite startup with unicorn status preps a key launch as the private space race takes off. Plus, later, an exclusive interview with Grindr CEO George Arison on earnings and the online dating industry push. All of that to come. This is Bloomberg. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Now, the private company Space Race is taking shape after venture capital firms spent more than $6 billion on space-related tech last year. SpaceX continues to dominate the market for launch and is growing its own constellation of Starlink satellites. But competition and customers are heating up between smaller players like Astanis and Andreessen Horowitz-backed satellite startup most recently valued at $1.4 billion. Joining me now is Australian CEO, John Gedmark. Let's go back to basics. Tell me about this company, because the reason on your show is that you have this big moment. A satellite is built, and it's moving from just down the road from where we're sitting now to Florida. Why? Yeah, thanks for having me here on the show. So uh, at Astronus, we built a new kind of satellite. So this is a microsatellite for higher orbits, uh, starting with a special orbit called geostationary orbit. So this is an orbit where we can put a satellite up into space and basically park it over a country, providing continuous service with just that one satellite. So that allows us to provide service at very low cost uh, compared to other types of, of satellite applications and, and uh, uh, compared to certainly the old school satellites that have come before. So today is a, a big day for us because we're launching our, uh, we, we just shipped our first satellite out the door, it is arriving uh, at Cape Canaveral as we speak, and there it's going to be integrated onto a SpaceX rocket for its ride to space. We're just showing those pictures on the screen of it being loaded into the container, back of a big rig, and off it goes. How does it get to space? Uh, we're going to be riding as a, a ride share on a Falcon Heavy rocket. So this is a big rocket. Uh, is there a date set? Uh, yes, SpaceX is, is looking at the week of April 8th. So we've got a launch window. We'll have a, a more definitive date as we get a little bit closer. Yeah. And in this instance, this is a satellite uh, that will provide uh, capability for a, a commercial customer, a private sector uh, customer, right? Yeah, that's right. So we have a private customer in uh, the U.S. state of Alaska uh, called Pacific Dataport. They're an Internet service provider there. 
Uh, we specialize at Astronus in providing trunking and backhaul capacity, so more for enterprise customers uh, and ISPs. And this will actually be the first time that the state of Alaska has had a satellite dedicated just for them. So the satellite is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not trying to cover all of the U.S., it's not trying to cover all of North America. It's actually just dedicated for uh, that area of Alaska and our customer there. And that's what we do at Astronus. We put up dedicated satellites for our customers and provide really broad, really low-cost uh, broadband communications. Uh, John, $1.4 billion valuation in your last round, and you have some big-name backers. They clearly see potential in your business. This is just one satellite, but is this revenue generating? Does this mark sort of a substantive step forward for the business side of what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a fantastic proof point for us, obviously. Uh, this is a, uh, our, our first satellite that will be generating substantial revenue and uh, recurring revenue on a, uh, on a services basis, which is okay. what we do. Uh, like a subscription, or what, what is the model for you? I mean, long term, how do you make money uh, based on the satellites that you're building? Yeah, we, we put up these satellites, we own and operate them, and we lease capacity. So gigabits a second on an ongoing uh, lease basis. So that's what we do for our customers, and we have projects like that in work all over the world. You asked about uh, what might be coming next, and we have uh, actually five satellites launching this year. This is just the first one, and then we're spooling up our satellite factory here in San Francisco as we speak uh, to, get to, the, get to the point where we can build actually two satellites a month, which is a huge production scale for this type of satellite. I want to get into production, but first, you, you talked about the kind of cadence uh, of, of satellites you hope to deploy for the rest of the year. Are those SpaceX as well? Uh, we have uh, procured a dedicated launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 for later this year for a four-pack of satellites. Uh, that is, uh, that'll be a first for us. This is the first time we've gotten uh, a whole dedicated rocket just for us. So that'll be four of our satellites flying together on that, uh, just us and, and nobody else. So first time we'll, we'll be moving away from uh, a rideshare launch. Uh, and then for future launches, uh, I, guess, I guess we'll see from there. Well, what, what was that experience like, you know, doing business with SpaceX? How far in advance did you have to commit to securing that Falcon 9 launch capacity? Yeah, I mean, you, you typically buy these rockets pretty far in advance, a couple years in advance, although they've been very flexible with us. Uh, and I'd say, honestly, they've been a fantastic partner as, as this new piece of space infrastructure that's been opening up space for uh, companies like ours and, and other applications all over the space ecosystem. How much did it cost you to secure that Falcon 9? Oh, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go into uh, pricing here, but um, SpaceX has, I, I, I think... You know, all things being equal, the rockets are incredibly affordable. Certainly, you look at what has come before, some of the old school rockets, you know, the Atlas and Delta ro rockets uh, that came before SpaceX, they were unbelievably expensive on right. uh, just a dollars per kilo basis. So uh, we found SpaceX to be incredibly affordable, and they've been a great partner for us. Yeah. So that's one part of your business, servicing private sector customers. The other side is, is the public sector, right? And you have existing relationships with... Uh, the, the DOD or, or the military. Yeah. How important is that, that to you, servicing what are basically public uh, requirements for, for connectivity and, and satellite capacity? Yeah, it's, it, it's an incredibly important uh, mission, and uh, you know, the world has changed. In just the last uh, year, we saw a, a, a huge change in the global dynamic, and now we've realized just how important it is uh, to be able to serve these national security needs. Um, I mean, just to, to give you one example, in uh, the Ukraine, uh, when the Russians invaded, one of the very first things they did, I think it was actually on day one of the invasion, is they launched a massive cyber attack against right. one of these very large geo satellites. And they took out this satellite in one fell swoop uh, that was providing broadband comms all over Ukraine. So, you know, when something like that happened, I mean, it, that was a... Uh, that was a real turning point, I think, in our industry, and it made the point of just how urgent a lot of this was for us to get better space infrastructure up and in place. It sounds like th there is demand for your satellites, and, and obviously your restriction is how quickly you can build them and deploy them into, into orbit. Is there a need to raise more funds to kind of bridge that gap, either privately or, or going to public markets? Uh, sure. I mean, we're, we're, right now we're heads down getting this first satellite up and uh, getting that to be successful. Certainly there'll be plenty of room to have that conversation later this year after we get that up and operating. That'll be a big moment for us. All right. Astranis CEO, John Gebmark, good luck getting to orbit. Thank you.
for joining the program. Now, coming up, a key tool of the crypto industry is suspended as the Silvergate fallout continues. We'll discuss all that next. This is Bloomberg. is real. This is not... Not crypto? That's not crypto. This is a technology which is staggering, and we're fully engaged. And the other thing you have to keep about AI, you need to be in the cloud to use the compute power, fundamentally, that you need for AI. And so that's why the cloud, digital AI, they're all kind of related that way. Some of JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon's thoughts on AI speaking to the other British Ed, Ed Hammond. Now, we're learning more about Microsoft's generative AI strategy to take on the likes of Oracle and Salesforce. Microsoft plans to build a co-pilot that can answer customer calls, summarize sales meetings, and build marketing pitches. Bloomberg's Rachel Metz is here to explain. Rachel, welcome. Now, for the audience, this is Rachel's first day at Bloomberg. Long-time artificial intelligence reporter. And while it's new to all of us, it's not new to Rachel. So... Let's start with the basics. What on earth is Microsoft talking about? It is wanting to use AI to help companies do a whole range of tasks that could be answering some customer service questions um, or using it for uh, at campaigns, like email-based campaigns. Um, it's going to be releasing it in a preview version, and, and it sounds like a, quite a number of companies are, are trying it out or will be trying it out. This is called Dynamics 365 Copilot. I don't want to put you on the spot, but why do all of these tools have such ridiculous names? Oh, gosh. I wish I knew. A lot of the time you hear a name for one of these and you're like, what does that even mean? Exactly? Like um, like Google's Bard, no offense, and uh, or like Meta going with Llama, which, which is, is an acronym. <laughs> yes. But even so, um, it, it raises a serious point that, you know, for a few weeks now and even longer for you, We've had a lot of folks on the show interested in generative AI. What's striking is so many of them are quickly pointing to sort of the enterprise application rather than some of the sort of consumer-facing chat GPT things. What are you hearing about why enterprise is such a key battleground for AI? I mean, I think if we look at technology over the years, enterprise is a great space because that's where money tends to be from the start, right? If you want to popularize the technology, a lot of the time it is companies that are willing to make those initial investments. Um, and that's where you're going to be getting recurring revenue as well. So it's probably a good place to start. Finally, what's on your radar? Day one at Bloomberg covering artificial intelligence. What are you kind of looking at at the moment? Oh, gosh. I mean, Everybody is looking at um, ChatGPT and um, chatbots in general right now. As we know, they're not brand new, but um, we're going to be seeing, I think, a lot more of that. And generative uh, content in general, uh, images, um, videos are slowly um, but surely coming on the horizon, or I should say quickly at this point. Um, So it should be an interesting uh, year for generated content. Day one done. Check. 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 (laughs) Uh, You can follow Rachel on at Rachel Metz on Twitter, Bloomberg's Rachel Metz. Thank you very much. Now, let's turn to crypto, which just lost a key piece of financial plumbing for moving money in the industry. Silvergate Capital's exchange network has been suspended as the crypto bank, frankly, struggles to survive. Here to explain why that matters. And again, Bloomberg Shanali, Basak shares under pressure this Monday. What's going on? Listen, shares are further under pressure. Nothing like we saw last week, Ed, when that going concern warning was brought up in a regulatory filing. But what is happening now? You see banking partners, you see exchange partners, you see more of the industry having distanced themselves in recent days from Silvergate. The closure of the Silvergate exchange network here, the halting of this, listen, Silvergate itself used to bring in deposits this way. It was essentially a way for the industry to almost instantaneously send money, deny Nominated in U.S. dollars and Europe, uh, sorry, euros through what was known as SEN. It was really an essential 
piece of plumbing in the crypto industry. It's not really shocking now to see this step back in such a drastic way because we are talking about Silvergate here, which is a, almost like a, a commercial bank. It's a consumer bank that has advances from the federal home loan bank and as right. operates under the jurisdiction of any typical bank in the United States would. It just There were just dozens of headlines on the Bloomberg terminal that mentioned Silvergate to start the week. How did the bank get into this mess? Listen, remember, so Sen was handling, like, a couple hundred thousand worth of transfers in the last couple of years. And things started to come under pressure last year. Remember, they bought that kind of uh, stablecoin business that Facebook was working on. They had to delay that as well. You saw Silvergate go from $222 under pressure for real. But then you saw FTX happen. And FTX had, say, less than 10% of its deposit base at Silvergate. So it was a meaningful client, but less than 10% of the total. And all of a sudden, problems started to exacerbate. The industry became more concerned. And then that deposit pulling happened at a faster rate after that November event from FTX. Bloomberg has also reported about the investigations that now Silvergate is under as well because of its relationship with Sam Bankman-Fried. So investigations underway as well as a financial problem here with deposits being reined in. And you have Silvergate fighting a two-prong war here when it looks at how it maps out its path forward. I bring this point up again that I made to you last week that we've been talking about Silvergate's issues for weeks, you know, months actually. And it continues to, to get worse and be a surprise. W what is the cautionary tale? I thought actually first time around a few weeks ago it was a cautionary tale. Uh, but what is it now? Listen, people have certainly had their eyes on Silvergate since the FTX debacle had blown up. But now you have the White House even saying that they're aware of the situation and looking at the situation. And it goes back to that point that I was making, Ed, that this is a bank like any other bank. This is part of the traditional financial system that took a chance on the crypto industry and now has to sell assets very cheaply just to pay advances from the federal home loan bank system. So you are looking at this firm where regulators gave it a past to enter the crypto industry and through its own potential missteps as well as broader industry issues here, you have a lot of questions among regulators about whether they'll allow this kind of thing again. So it's about confidence in the future from U.S. banking regulators as well as Silvergate itself and the removal of critical infrastructure for the crypto industry that enabled so much trading to happen. Bloomberg, Shanali Basak, just terrific reporting constantly on top of this story. Thank you. Now, coming up, Grinder reports fourth quarter results as it continues to expand its ecosystem. You see their shares down almost 8% in after ads. We're going to be joined by George Arison, the CEO of Grinder, coming up in the next block to go through some of those numbers. That's all next. This is Bloomberg. Grinder reporting its fourth quarter earnings, rising revenue year over year. Though adjusted EBITDA fell by about $4 million. Some of the other headlines, top line growth of 41% in 2022. It's forecasting top line growth 25% or greater in 2023. Let's bring in the CEO, George Arison, for more. You see there the stock down almost 8%, George. Your call's just wrapped. Is there something that the street's getting wrong? Well, I don't really pay much attention to what the stock does on any given day. That's not where we should focus. Uh, we are in here for the long haul, building a really awesome company for our users to use and creating a lot of shareholder value for our stockholders over the long term. And I think the, the company had a really amazing year last year, you know, uh, from financials and or engagement metrics when we had 111 billion chat spent in, in one year. It's really incredible. And I think we're set up for a really fantastic year this year, uh, continuing to really drive a lot of growth in the business with very strong EBITDA for the, for the year, uh, really best in class EBITDA, frankly, and uh, continue to really focus on building a really great product. You talked a lot on the earnings call and at least at the beginning of the earnings call about your international users. And I'm really interested in that. How big is the opportunity for you globally and in, in maybe some markets that we discuss less here on Bloomberg Technology? 
Yeah, I mean, Gr Grindr is a very international product. Obviously, we are very big in the United States and in some of the developing developed world, like in Europe. But we also have a lot of users all over the world in 190 countries around the world. And in a lot of these countries, uh, society is changing um, the same way that being LGBTQ today in the U.S. is a lot more acceptant than it was, say, 20 years ago. Um, parts of the world are now going through that same change today. And that's going to be a huge secular tailwind for Grindr um, as we scale in the future, because there are countries now that are on the verge of, for example, marriage equality. Um, after that, Grindr will be a, a um, you know, bigger presence in those countries uh, inevitably. And so that's something that we're very much uh, excited about to take advantage of. And Grindr has always been a kind of important connective tissue for um, gay, bi, and, and trans users. Uh, and it will continue to be in a lot of these countries in the years to come. A big theme for the industry in recent months has been the premium tier of subscription. Um, many of the, the platforms experimenting with pretty high prices, right? I know that you also talk about premium, the removal of ads as an example. But, but how big a strategy is that for you? Is there demand for kind of a higher end product right now? So for us, I think it's both lower end and higher end because Grinders historically had two price points, a 99 price point and a 39.99 price point. The 99.99 price point is probably a little bit too high for a set of our users, and it doesn't make sense to have that be the entry point. So offering something on the lower end as the entry point, maybe with less ads and a couple of additional features that some people really want us to do. We hear that from users directly. We hear it in our research. And then on the on the higher end, there's definitely an opportunity. I think the reality is that finding the long-term mate, uh, if you're gay or you're bi, is a lot harder than if you're a straight person. Uh, and so there's a lot of really awesome ML-based matching that we can do uh, across the world or in the United States, in countries you're in, that is not available to you today. And I think people will be more willing to pay a higher price uh, for that. So I would not be surprised if we do something on the lower end and we also do something on the higher end. What's so interesting about Grinder, George, is the LGBTQ uh, database, essentially, right? If you think about your users globally, I know you talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning on the call. How well positioned do you think you are to leverage those tools to boost the top and bottom line? Well, we have incredible data about our users, right? Like I mentioned earlier, there were 111 billion chat messages sent in Grindr last year. That's an incredible database of user behavior uh, and, and what they want. Uh, we haven't really built anything to take advantage of all this information yet, but there's a lot of really great ML, machine learning, and artificial intelligence they can deploy, whether it's for generative purposes to help users compose the right messages, or from matching perspective, matching people better, and helping them find the right relationships, or from the customer service perspective, managing the product to have less spam uh, and less, uh, you know, not real profiles uh, through ML. These are all huge right. opportunities and something that we'll be investing uh, resources into uh, in the quarters to come. George, real quick, have you spoken to OpenAI as an example? You know, people are trying to find tools for them and get moving on this. Who are you talking to? We've not spoken to them. I mean, we're going to try to build as much as we can on our own. But there are some really awesome companies out there doing really cool things in AI, and certainly partnering with them is a possibility for us. But long term, we'd want to own all the AI we do ourselves because that's a proprietary thing for Grindr. We're also super conscious about um, you know, our users' data. We have a lot of users who are very discreet, and, and we need to be private uh, with their information. And so we generally tend to do more things internally uh, than externally. Grinder CEO George Arison, straight off the call. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you very much. Great. Now, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget, check out the podcast. So much to recap from this show alone. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts, on the terminal, on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. We're only one day into the week and already headlines across the world of AI, Apple, markets, and so much more to come this week. Stay tuned into Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg.